All right. Well, we'll get started. Thank you, everybody. It's great to see such a, a great audience today. Um, I am delighted to welcome everybody to the Department of Medicine's Research Day. Uh, really, it's an opportunity for us to celebrate the breadth and depth of innovative research in our department and in our community. And today, we're not coming together not only to share our latest discoveries, but to have an opportunity to collaborate and network and get to know each other. Um, today, we also have a very special guest speaker for Research Day, Dr. Fernando Ogwin. Did I get that? Thank you. Um, and it's also a double, uh, double honor because we are also honoring Dr. Bill Bussey, um, as this is, in addition to Research Day, our annual Bill Bussey Lectureship. Um, and so we get to celebrate the research and legacy of Dr. Bussey as well. So to introduce Fernando, we have Dr. Lauren Denlinger, um, our vice chair of research um, for the Department of Medicine. So. Thank you, Lynn. And um, thank you all for being here today and for those online, welcome. Um, we're really excited to, to have the first uh, joint uh, presentation of the Bussey Professorship lectures as well as uh, research day. Um, so to introduce uh, Dr. Bussey, uh, Dr. Bussey has been a, a true badger for most of his life and career. Um, he is known for all things asthma and for leadership. Uh, he has been um, the allergy section chief for many years, the department of medicine chair for four, uh, the chair for many international societies as well as the US Asthma Guidelines Chair in 2003. Uh, he received an ATS Breathing for Life Award in 2014 and uh, has the record, uh, at least at the time, for the largest NIH award in the history of the University of Wisconsin uh, through the Inner City Asthma Consortium. Um, so with that, um, I will begin my introduction for Dr. Olguin. Um, he's a good friend, and I've known him since at least uh, 2008 uh, through the Severe Asthma Research Program and the uh, uh, Asthma Clinical Trial Networks for NHLBI. Uh, he grew up in Mexico City, where he also uh, went to medical school. His internship and fellowship were at Emory University in Atlanta. Uh, he joined the faculty there as an assistant professor and was also a medical epidemiologist at the CDC. Uh, during his career development, he got a master's in public health at Emory. Uh, in 2008, he was recruited to the University of Pittsburgh uh, and joined the asthma network uh, uh, communities there with Sally Wenzel. Um, he was recruited then to University of Colorado in 2016, um, where he is um, currently the director of asthma research. Um, he has a, a named professorship, which I'm forgetting off the top of my head, uh, and is the newly minted um, uh, division Chief for, for Pulmonary and Critical Care at the University of Colorado. He's received many awards over the, the course of his career, the most recent of which is a Faculty Development Award, which will import, be important for the, and relevant for the career mentoring sessions uh, later today. Uh, this was from the American Academy of Allergy, Asthma, and Immunology uh, this, past, this uh, past February. His early research focused on air pollution and its impacts on lung health. Uh, but more recently has um, been interested in severe asthma phenotypes. And yesterday we had a de delightful lecture about airway epithelial cell dysfunction in patients with severe asthma related to uh, L-arginine metabolism. He's been continuously funded through the NIH, Department of Defense, American Lung Association, and the EPA, and has authored over 220 papers. Today's talk is uh, shown here, Respiratory Health Disparities, Root Causes and Opportunities for Action. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Fernando Olguin, and we also have a Bussey Award uh, plaque for him today, which we'll present now uh, with a photo shoot, and then uh, I'll turn it over to, to Dr. Holguin for the lecture. So, okay. All right. Can you hear me back back there? 
Thank you. Thank you so much for being here um, for this invitation. It's been truly, truly special. I had a lot of fun. Um, got to go to a top, top chef restaurant. Doesn't happen very often. Um, but really being the, the Bill Bossy professor, it's really invited professor is a, it's a huge feather in my cap. And I'm, I'm deeply, deeply honored because Bill and Nisar and Lawrence are people I've, I've admired through my career and I look up to them um, as to how to be a researcher and a, and a clinician and a leader. Uh, so thank you so much. And today I want to talk to you about something that's really relevant. Um, and it's a, it's a serious problem. It's a serious public health problem that I think we don't give a lot of um, deference to. Um, so no significant disclosure. So I want to give you really talk about some of the most important respiratory health disparities that we're facing. And then summarize how some of the um, environment influences some of these outcomes. And then discuss uh, issues that relate to systemic and structural racism and how those impact uh, respiratory health disparities. And then at the end, I'll talk about, you know, when people talk about disparities, it's always like bad news, how bad we have it. But, but there are good examples of things being done that I think are, are important to be mentioned. If you go to the CDC, the CDC has a, uh, an area where they talk about health disparities and they, they have a, a definition, which I think is pretty good which is important that these are preventable differences in the burden of injury, violence, or opportunities to achieve optimal health that are experienced by disadvantaged populations. And these are, typically, these are very much intimately related to sociopolitical uh, issues of our times. And, and really are many factors that go into why people experience more disease burden than others, including poverty, environmental threats, access to healthcare, uh, individual and behavioral factors, education, and, and inequalities. But this is very complicated. If you look at health disparities, there's a lot of um, factors that go into it. And so how do you make sense of it? How do you study it? Um, the National Institute for Minority Health at NIH has this scheme in which they say, uh, basically their schema is that you have proximal factors which relate to your biological response to stress, for example. You have intermediate issues, for example, environment, your home, where you live. And then there's distal factors, which is a structural uh, how are you treated by institutions and by your government and policies? And all of these eventually sort of interact with each other and you get um, disparities in health. What's interesting is that none of them is, is sufficient, but all of them contribute for these things to happen. Right? You know, I like this, this approach better by Dr. Krieger in public health in, the, in, school, in Harvard School of Public Health, who's written extensively about this topic in which we have more of an eco-social model, if you will. So there are ways of living and working that are differently afforded by people. I think everybody would agree on that. And eventually we have class and racial inequality, which have different um, living standards and working conditions and lead to different environmental exposures. So at the end, what you have is an ecosystem in which you're experiencing healthcare inequality or inequity, people facing racism, prejudice, discrimination, uh, different social determinants of health and many different environmental exposures. And at the end, what you have is a biological response, stress, obesity, and other factors that contribute to this thing. And this happens. So all of this comes together and explains why we have differential patterns of and the distribution of disease in society. Yeah, and this, you know, if you look at the bottom of your screen, this, this actually affects all the way from in utero, uh, all the way to childhood, adulthood, senior adults, and through epigenetics, the next generation, and the next and the next. So the, the ramifications is really, uh, really quite remarkable. So according to the Economic um, Health, uh, Race and Gender um, Journal, respiratory inequalities are a major public health problem in the United States have not only persisted, but have gotten worse. So if you look at this study here on, on, on your screen on the left side, what you're looking is the prevalence of asthma in adults over a long period of time from 1973 to 2015. And you're looking at uh, those with the, the Quintile one is the loss with the, with the lowest income. So look at the prevalence of those with lower income has gone up at a much steeper rate compared to those with more money or in, in, the, in quintile five. And the same thing can be said for COPD. You see more COPD, more asthma over the decades in those that are poorer. And more importantly, if you look at in this, in this study, the impact of, of this is uh, comparing those that are in the lower income compared to the highest income and the effect on lung function on FEV1, you see that there's actually very profound reductions for both men and women, suggesting that the impact of poverty in lung function has gotten worse over time. There are many communities across the United States that experience a greater burden of respiratory diseases due to many different types of environmental exposures uh, and different discriminatory and racist policies. So these are some of the examples 
Some communities in Pittsburgh, for example, where you see these old communities very, very close to steel mills, um, poor housing conditions, and then uh, many communities divided by uh, high thoroughfares or highways and exposing people to high particulate matter and other exposures. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about redlining today because this is a very interesting issue that pertains to, to respiratory health very directly. So in, in 1934 under um, uh, FDR in the sort of a new deal following the, the Great Depression, the government decided to, you know what, let's invest in, in, in housing, let's back up and insure mortgages uh, so that people can build, you know, following the depression, the economy needed to be spearheaded into a different direction. And what they did is they created these maps the Home Loaner Association maps in 1933, and they decided we have areas in, in, uh, in blue that are called the best and then desirable, then the yellows were, were considered declining, and then the red were considered hazardous. And what the government did is like, they said, we're not gonna invest in the red areas. And the banks and other companies followed through and said, well, if you're not investing, I'm not investing, right? And it happens that those red areas were where, where, where blacks and poor people lived, right? So this is, this is what redlining means. And I actually read the manual, which is very interesting. Um, it's a bit dry at times, but I, I pulled out this, this phrase because it really, it's, it's like racism in its clearest form. It says the infiltration of inharmonious racial groups, i.e. non-white, will lower the level of land values and lessen the desirab desirability of residential areas. So people are saying like, not only invest, but we don't want intermixing. We want people to stay where they are. Black people stay in the red line districts and other people stay in the other districts. And it was, that was actually the standard approach. And that has had tremendous consequences up to date. So what you're seeing here is the effects of redlining in the National Community Reinvestment Coalition at a national level. So these are the, um, here in the red, are the hazardous areas and the majority, 60% of them are still minority populations, that's, that's today. And shown here in the gray areas, the majority of them are low to middle income uh, persons. So these areas still, predominantly inhabited by minorities uh, that are poor. And those are serious consequences. This is uh, St. Louis. And what you're seeing here is the, uh, the redlining district on the right side on the top. And you can see that those red areas also have higher levels of social vulnerability index, which is a composite um, outcome that states how vulnerable communities are to stressors and impacts on the environment. And they also have lower uh, life expectancy, right? So these red line segregated communities experience a much higher rate of risk factors that are associated with disease, with respiratory disease in particular, like poverty, unemployment, violent crime, poor housing, higher levels of in, uh, in industry and traffic pollution exposure, and are more likely to be identified as medically underserved. This is a, a really nice article that was published in the New York Times, where it shows that this is Oakland, California, that the red line neighborhoods are also, for example, much higher, have a much higher exposure to nitrogen dioxide, which is a traffic related pollutant that causes disease in people with asthma. And again, going back to Madison, this is, a, this is from the red line uh, map in, in Madison. And the Rand Corporation has a website that you can, I recommend you to look at it. You can go to any city and you can actually see many different factors uh, by red line in distribution in different cities. So here's, this is Madison showing that the red areas have a much higher levels of particulate matter pollution exposure and are more likely to be exposed to traffic in, clo in close proximity. This is today. We did a study in Colorado because Colorado used to, uh, Colfax Avenue used to be the highway to the mountains. And so you see all these hotels that look like they were built in the 30s and 40s because they were. Um, but now these are not hotels anymore. They're used by migrant populations and, and poor people. And so we did a study requested by the community to look at environmental indoor allergens and, and, um, and particular matter exposure on black carbon. So you see that those that live in these residential motels, especially many of them children, are exposed to much higher levels of fine particulate matter and carbon. And so this is again, you know, poverty and exposures happen together. And this matters because as shown by the group in California, that this is the 12 city studies and others, if you live in close proximity to a roadway, like it shows here on, the, on this graphic, you're more likely to have asthma or to be diagnosed with asthma, both incident and prevalent disease. So if you live within 50 to 100 meters, um, especially if you've lived there for a long time, you're more likely to develop asthma. So for example, people are about two and a half more likely to develop asthma if you're, in, if you're within 75 meters of a major thorough highway. So this is a study we did um, in the US-Mexico border when I was working transitioning from the CDC out. 
uh, followed a cohort of children with asthma and controls. Uh, you can see them here on the map. And what we found is that if you look at the in different buffers, how much traffic you're exposed, for example, within a 50, mo 50 meter buffer area of your home, those individuals had, those kids had higher levels of exhaled nitric oxide and it tapers down as, as you move away from, from your buffer area of your, where you live and they have lower lung function. So again, these, these things, the communities that experience high levels of exposures have chronic effects on lung function and inflammation. But it, it, actually, gets, it actually gets worse. So as everybody knows in this room, you know, climate change is a real problem. And so um, again, another fantastic article from the New York Times looking how, how decades of, of racist housing policy have left vulnerable neighborhoods much more susceptible to heat waves. So shown here, for example, this is Richmond, Virginia. The, the areas in red are um, red lining districts that are also have the highest levels of temperature compared to other areas that are more affluent, that are in blue. And the reason is, one of the reasons is because if you look at red areas, again, in, in, in Richmond, for example, the green areas are tree canopy areas. So all of these areas don't have trees, right? So they have, they have concrete, they have pavement, but they don't have trees, so the, the heat index is much higher. And, they, and therefore, at a national level, if you look at red, uh, red line in districts, they're about two and a half to three uh, uh, degrees in surface temperature higher compared to the green areas, which is dramatic, right? And so you can see, for example, this is an area that's considered, this is in a red line district in Virginia, and this is an area that's on a, on a, on a green district, They're very different environments. And as published by Mary Rice and others, you know, environmental warming is really linked to, to poor lung health, increased rates of exacerbation um, for asthma and COPD through air pollution and other factors. So I'm gonna go into like how these drives disease, burn of disease. So here you have, this is an ecological study that was published uh, from um, uh, California in different cities, so Oakland, San Diego, Los Angeles on the top. You can see the red districts, the green districts. And then on the bottom in purple, you can see that the more, the, the sort of the more intensity of purple is the higher rates of uh, asthma emergency room visits. So you can clearly see visually that the red areas are much more likely to have people in, uh, presenting to the, uh, uh, to the emergency room for asthma. So shown here, this is age adjusted asthma ED visit rates. Uh, com look at, compare the red to the green. So clearly those response that people in, the, in this, in this uh, red line districts have much more burden of disease for asthma. This is a really wonderful paper that was published by Sally Wenzel and Alexander Schuller uh, just recently, where they looked at red lining districts in, in, this is Pittsburgh. You can see all these areas, red areas, a lot of the, the rivers where the steel mills happen. And what they did is they looked at a thousand patients from the Asthma Institute Registry and so people in, very, very obvious, people in uh, red areas have higher exposure to carbon monoxide, to PM2.5, to sulfur dioxide, which is related to industries, and, and organic carbons, volatile organic carbons, so VOCs. And then when you look at outcomes on these patients, uh, those that are on the red area are more likely to have uncontrolled asthma, are more likely to be an exacerbated prone phenotype, have more likely to have daily symptoms, miss work or school because of asthma, but also are more likely to have diabetes and more likely to have eczema, but less likely to be receiving immunotherapy like an anti-IG drug. So you, you may think, well, this is, this is clearly all environment, but then Sally and Alexander looked at this paper and said, let's compare blacks and whites that are within red line districts. And if you look at within red line districts, those that are black are actually much more affected than whites in terms of their asthma severity or having diabetes and eczema and are more likely to use short acting beta agonists to rescue medications on a daily visit and are, and are more likely to have lower lung functions. So to me, this suggests that it's not, it's not just environment, but is the actual, what actually happens to people facing discrimination of being part of a racial uh, a minority group as well. Uh, this is a story from Cincinnati where they looked at uh, emergency room visits related to poor housing. And what the story shows is that children living in poor housing are about 84 times, 80 percent more likely to go to the emergency room as well. So housing does matter. And eventually it all comes together and it creates these hotspots. So hotspots, this is uh, data from, from Emory in Atlanta from Ann Fitzpatrick's group, where they looked at kids that when re were being readmitted to the emergency room all the time. And they found that those had multiple admissions 
were more likely to have a higher social vulnerability index, uh, and they were less likely to have a, a preferable score on the child opportunity index. The child opportunity index is a composite neighborhood evaluation that tells you how good is an environment for a kid to, to, to prosper, right? So you can see, and all of these hotspots analytically are associated with longer hospital stays, poor housing, living near a major road, less green space, food deserts, more air pollution and extreme heat days and less education. And it's not all, you know, environment is many things, right? When you live in a neighborhood, it's the air pollution you breathe, but it's also the violence that you experience. So in this uh, study from Boston, they looked at uh, shooting rates in different uh, redlining districts. And if you compare the red to the green, those that live in redlining districts are about 3.2 3 times more likely to have experienced um, some sort of exposure to gun violence or shooting. And this, actually, this is particularly interesting because it interacts with other factors. This study that was done by one of my collaborators, Jane Cloherty, where they followed a cohort of kids for about 18 years, looking at what was the contribution of nitrogen dioxide exposure to the development of asthma. And what they found, this is, this is a cohort of kids followed and their overall um, greener dots were more exposed to nitrogen dioxide, again, as a marker of traffic exposure. And you can see that those that were exposed to nitrogen dioxide, but also higher exposure to violence, were about two and a half times more likely to develop asthma. Whereas those that were not exposed to violence, you didn't see an effect. So there's an interaction between pollution and stress. And, and if you look at the way they, they actually um, ascertained exposure to violence, it was not very complicated. Um, hearing gunshots, verbal abuse, shooting, having witnessed some stabbing. Um, so these things actually do come together and make the disease worse. We all know that there's systemic and structural racisms, um, our form of racism that pervasively and deeply are embedded into our system laws, written and unwritten policies and entrenched practices and beliefs, and ultimately produce uh, and perpetuate widespread unfair treatment and oppression of people of color with adverse, many adverse health consequences. So I'm gonna focus on three areas, moving a little bit from environment into how this systemic and structural racism in our society impacts how we ascertain health, the, the, the tools that we use, how this leads to inequities in treatment, diagnostic evaluation and referral, and how this causes chronic stress that ultimately adverse will, uh, impact, adversely impacts well, well-being. This is a fantastic paper that, that everybody really should read. Uh, it's called Hidden in Plain Sight. And they basically they do an appraisal of all the algorithms that we use in clinical medicine from renal to pulmonary to cardiology. And I, I'm gonna give you the three major messages of this, of this paper. So the algorithms and practice guidelines adjust or correct for a patient's race or ethnicity to individualize risk assessments and guide clinical decisions. Think about like how you estimate GFR or lung function testing that you adjust for race. However, there's very well-known data that there's more genetic variation within racial groups than between groups. So, Racial is not a biological construct, it's a social construct and many other things. So it really makes no sense to adjust for race in any of these instruments uh, for the most part. So the conclusion of the paper is that race adjustment does nothing to address the cause of the disparity, but instead these adjustments propagate part of the inequities that we see in healthcare. And I'm gonna show you some examples. Let's do a little bit of history because this is really interesting. Um, there's a, by the way, there's a great book called Racing the Machine that talks about how this parametry was developed and how race adjustments came to be. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about that. Uh, Thomas Jefferson in 1785, in his note of the state's Virginia, suggested that the structure of the pulmonary apparatus was different among black slaves. With really nothing to substantiate that. Samuel Cartwright um, expanded on those ideas and wrote a paper here in the Medical and Surgical Journal of New Orleans, saying that uh, the, the black population, slaves predominantly had pulmonary deficiency. But it wasn't until Benjamin Gould's um, landmark 1864 study where the Sanitary Commission said, you know, the spirometry was the hot thing back then. And said, well, I want you to go and look at civil, uh, civil war soldiers and look at their vital capacity. And so what, they, what, what he did is he looked at, um, you know, 20,000 people and found white, evaluated white soldiers, full blacks, whatever that means, mulattos and Indians, and found that the lung capacity of those that were black was lower than those that were white. But what he failed to consider is that he didn't adjust for anything. This was just raw values. 
And the fact is that if you read a little bit of the history, black soldiers in, in civil war were escaping from the South in many instances and were malnourished, were poor, and had a lot of different chronic conditions. So, you know, that's the reason that explains the lower vital capacity, not biological issues. But these ideas were taken off by Hoffman in England and actually which, which a health statistician, statistician and basically they acknowledge the fact that yes, black subjects have about six to 12% lower vital capacity and this is why we adjust for race. It's, it's unbelievable, but until now, we're sort of re-examining these associations. Danny Colon from our group uh, and Matthew Griffith looked at the United Network for Organ Transplant System data, uh, 33,000 patients, and asked the question, what happens, you know, because these are patients that had interstitial lung disease that were undergoing transplant evaluation. So what really determines how much they weigh in the list is the, it's called the lung allocation score. So what they did is they used white adjustments replace the black adjustments on the estimation of, of lung function. And what they found is that the lung allocation score went up. And that translates ultimately to the fact that race adjustments for blacks means 20% more waiting time to get a lung transplant, which is incredible. Uh, and if you look at some of the other clinical estimates, this is data from uh, Spiromics, which is a large uh, cohort observational study. We look at COPD assessment tests and lung function. The red line here shows the uh, African-American regression using the adjustment values. And the bottom line is that when you adjust for race, you underestimate the disease burden. And so people are less likely to receive benefits in disability, insurance, and transplantation. But things, unfortunately, have, have gone worse. So shown here is the percent distribution uh, of counties by poverty and equality in the US. And showing in the red is that we continue to experience worsening of many issues that relate to poverty and inequality. And ultimately what that means is that people are gonna get less access to treatment. Uh, this study we did, it's, it's a little bit old. Uh, this is when I was at the CDC, but I think it's still uh, very relevant data. This is national data looking at utilization of asthma medications by, by race in the US. And so the dark, the dark uh, dots are blacks and Hispanics with persistent asthma showing that they have much more greater emergency room utilizations, but they're also more likely to be using rescue inhalers at a higher rate. And in this particular study in, in children, you know, children were a lot less likely to be using inhaled corticosteroids compared to whites, uh, and were more likely to be given daily uh, albuterol, which we know is not a good thing. So a lot of health disparities. Unfortunately, in my view, things are going to get worse in terms of medication disparity. And the reason is because for those of you that are not asthma focus as we many of us in this room are. Um, the new guidelines stipulate that the, re the preferred rescue inhaler is the use of inhaled corticosteroids with a long acting beta uh, agonist. So uh, here shown different steps of the GINA guidelines and the reliever, the preferred reliever is as needed inhaled corticosteroids and formoral instead of albuterol. Um, the problem is that albuterol is much cheaper uh, than formoral and, but and budesonide. So this, this is gonna create problems with access for patients to, to, to access the preferred type of, of treatment that we're uh, giving to patients now. And needless to say, I'm not gonna go into it because it gets me very upset. We have approved inhaled epinephrine. So many patients use that as well as, as treatment for rescue. So I think there's very, this is from another New York Times uh, article in 2021 where they talked about how racism impacts uh, care and it's true that racism makes our patients sick. This is the University of Colorado, some of our students who are now graduated. Um, one example is, for example, that we know that uh, black women have much higher uh, perinatal complications uh, compared to white women, and is not explained by poverty. So they've done the studies, it is not explained by poverty. Um, and we know that the black females patients, when they, they opt for more preventive care, when their physician is black uh, and the mortality rate goes down. Um, and one of the issues is that it's a fantastic book uh, about this factor is one of the issues is that um, black females experience a lot of um, discrimination and uh, in many different forms from their providers which creates a stress and the stress associated with higher perinatal uh, morbidity. And it's shown here, this is the, uh, what's called weathering effect. So if you're someone who's con constantly being stigmatized and, you, and you're prejudiced and you're dealing with all these things, it creates a stress in your system that you, 
Eventually, that chronic stress leads to many different health conditions. So shown here, for example, is the allostatic load, which is a combination of different biomarkers that represent stress. It's not a perfect measure, but it's a, it's a measure showing that uh, over age, the, the allostatic load or, or this stress biomarker response is much higher in blacks and whites, and it, gets, it, get, it goes up with, with age. But the group that experiences the most is actually black females compared to other, other groups. And that has direct implications in asthma. This is a story that was published in Chess looking at perceived discrimination associated with asthma and related outcomes in minority youth. So showing that um, if you're African-American and you perceive discrimination, you're more likely to have um, severe asthma, um, particularly uh, if you experience discrimination and you have severe disease, about three times more likely to experience morbidity. The Institute of Medicine has published a fantastic book which is called Unequal Treatment, in which they really talk about all the factors that relate to systemic and structural inequalities. And, and you know, the message is that minority populations experience less quality of care than to non-minority populations by factors that relate to how health systems are operated and discrimination biases and stereotyping and other types of uncertainty. And I'm gonna give you some, some examples of that. This is again, going back to redlining, this is uh, Boston, uh, where they looked at how people uh, that are at risk undergo screening procedures for lung cancer. And so in, this, in, in redlining districts, black women are 61% and black men are 47%, less likely to receive a screening for lung cancer um, compared to other groups. And this has real implications for healthcare. Even though this is a single site study, it's been replicated in other sites. This is what happens to patients once they get a CT scan and somebody says, hey, you have a nodule, you need to go see someone. And if you're African-American and you're being treated by a white physician, these people waited more than 500 days to be referred for subsequent care. And if, you were, if they were treated by an Asian physician, they were almost two years out. And look at whites, whites uh, were only experienced a few days. Uh, so it's such a dramatic differences in, in, in the way we deliver care. And this was not confounded by any of these factors. And if you look at our national level, in the national stage, Black patients are less likely to undergo staging as you'll hear uh, on, on the left. And then once they go undergo staging, they should have surgery. They're not offered surgery. They're not offered surgery at a higher rate compared to whites. And so there's a lot of discrimination in evaluation and treatment and treatment offered. So it is much easier to talk about uh, disparities than figuring ways to reduce them, right? And if you look at the literature is, is as I actually did the experiment. If you, if you go to PubMed and you search respiratory health disparities, you get nine, almost 2,000 papers. If you add reducing respiratory disparities, you drop by about 80%, yeah. right? And if you add racism to that mix, you drop to a handful of papers. So a lot of work to be done, right? Uh, the, this MMWR from the CDC suggests that there are specific components to projects that can effectively reduce disparities. They obviously have to be innovative. They have to be evidence-based. They have to have partnerships with the community, effective communication and policy commitment. But I would add that they have to be cost-effective and sustainable solutions. They have to be really program evaluations that's, that's outcome-driven in partnership with, with society and with community groups. They have to use dissemination and implementation sciences uh, and requires multiple system levels of intervention. Like you, you cannot really be effective unless you have local policy and other factors. Uh, supporting you. One example that they, that they highlight in this paper is the Asthma Community Initiative, in which they've gone to Boston and work with the community to identify what are, their, what are the factors and educate people and reduce their burden of exposures. And they've over time shown sustainable levels of reduction in, in asthma morbidity, shown here a year after the intervention. So there are, there are many examples that occur like that. I'm not gonna go deep. This is data from Stan Seffler, who's done a lot of work in schools in Denver using implementation and in relation to communities. And the response has been, I mean, it's been going on for 10, 15 years, but they have dramatically reduced exacerbation rates in schools and improved medication utilization by partnership with the school and the communities. One of the, uh, with the ATS, one of our official uh, statements is that if you look at many studies, people that are underrepresented in the research population that we study are minority groups. And COVID is a great example of that. So we actually put a call out that we need to do a much better job to make sure that we include subjects that are minority populations so they can really, we can understand the impact of our research interventions um, in these population subgroups. So, but that requires 
you know, changes in federal policy, institutional behavior, interpersonal, individual barriers to be looked at so that at the end we can enrich findings for all populations, which is not currently the case. We need better representation. I feel this is data from the uh, AMC, most recent, 2018-2019. You see that uh, medical students in the United States only represent 6% that are Black, and Latinos only 5%. Um, so quite a bit of underrepresentation, and we know that representation matters because we leads to better treatment and better experiences for patients. I urge you to take a look at this website, Black Men in White, Co in white Coats. It's a great set of videos that, that really go into detail as to how important this is and how to tackle it. Um, really fantastic. They came and visited our school. It was really, really great. We need to abandon race and focus on racism. This is a call for everybody that does research and takes care of patients. So the deeply rooted belief that race as determined by phenotypical characteristics like the skin color or facial features reflects fundamental biological differences, but in fact does not. It does not. You know, phenotype has many things to do, but it's not a biological construct. We must continue to collect and analyze data on the population groups that have been racialized into socially constructed categories called races. We must not, however, continue to use that term. It is not only the obstacle to dismantling racism, but it's a significant one. And this is from a, a paper on a race, focusing on racism from public health. As an example, this is a story that was published in Epidemiology uh, not too long ago, that you know, despite this community consensus that we should stop using race as something we just like, you know, you, for those of you that do data analysis and you, we adjust for race, why are you adjusting for race? What is, and how has that changed your, your, your beta estimates and your cofactors? Have you thought about exactly what that means? So adjusting for race is actually not the, not the way to go and we should not be doing that anymore. We should actually be understanding how data applies to different racial groups and what it means for a particular group. So this story shows that we, you know, there's still a high burden of utilization of race as a covariate predominantly. Uh, and very few studies actually specifically determine what race is as a construct and why they're involving it in their story. So we need to tackle implicit bias in, in healthcare. And there's, I think there's a lot of really good um, change in this, a lot of good training. But we know from this New England Journal of Medicine study that implicit biases are common. And for black patients means uh, negative ratings of the clinical interactions, less patient certainness, care, poor communication, under treatment of pain, and view of black patients as less medically adherent than white patients. In education, implicit biases, I was really, I was really, this, this, when I read these statistics, it actually made me very sad. Half of US medical students surveyed in this study reported having been exposed to negative comments about black patients by the attending or the resident physicians. And it, it does matter because if you, they follow these, these students over time and by year four, their own uh, implicit racial bias grew dramatically, right? So it does matter how we role model behavior in front of our students. So this is a comprehensive study by Alan Baptist and, and Andrea Apter's group where they talk about how, do we, how, 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 can, uh, how can we reduce health disparities in asthma as an example. We need awareness and education we need training to create inclusive medical environments to promote anti-racism, to avoid implicit biases. We need workforce initiatives, such as that, those that foster support and develop initiatives to increase healthcare and, and scientific workforce diversity. We need obviously better research inclusion. We need environmental interventions at many different levels, and we need very strong advocacy efforts to address wealth inequality, environmental injustice, food insecurity, educational inequity, and overall, all the structural drivers of asthma health disparities. I think that, that um, I had a chance working on this talk to read more of the work about W. Um, du Bois, W.E.B. Du Bois, uh, who was a, a, an American sociologist, who's an incredibly brilliant man. And when he, he was one of the people that advocated very early about not dichotomizing race into white and blacks. He actually thought it was a bad idea. And so people ask you, so the people ask them, so the, what's, what's race then if it's not black or white? And his, his answer, and I'll read it for you, Race is a vast family of human beings, generally of common blood and language, always of common history, tradition, and impulses, who are both voluntary and involuntary striving together for the accomplishment of certain more or less vividly conceived ideals of life. The best definition of race I've ever read was 100 years ago. I urge you to read these two books. This is from Heather, Heather McGee that talks about zero-sum politics and why racism costs everyone, not only minority groups. 
at different levels of society. And this other group is a fantastic, fantastic book that talks about segregation um, of our society through redlining, which is called The Color of War. So in my concluding remarks, I just wanna leave you with a couple of thoughts. Respiratory health disparities in vulnerable populations result from the chronic exposure to environmental, societal, political, and structural inequities. It is a major public health problem, one that we normally don't talk about much. Respiratory health disparities can, can and should be prevented by multi-level interventions that partner with and are funded by the, uh, so that communities can ensure sustainable, scalable, and culturally sensitive interventions. We as researchers and healthcare providers a community need to change our concept of race from being a biological determinant to understanding it as a social con construct. We need to focus a lot more in what is it about being of a particular race group that causes health, not necessarily being that race. We need to be more concerned about understanding and mitigating the adverse biological effects that individuals or populations experience, again, from being members of a minority group facing racism and discrimination. I think that's where the, where the real intervention is to happen. Thank you. Thank you, Fernando, for an amazing, inspiring, and thought-provoking talk. Thank you. Uh, and, and I would like to hear from you um, for your generosity, leadership, and it enables us to speakers such as Fernando as visiting professors. So thank you again. And so uh, for questions, we have boxes around. If, reminder, if you talk in the microphone, please uh, repeat the question. Okay, well, then I'm going to start. <laughs> Thank you again for a fantastic talk. Uh, this was a fantastic way to kick off research day with our theme of health equity and inequalities. Um, so I'm, I'm curious, I've done, uh, I'm from the Center for Tobacco Research and Intervention, and we do a lot of work now looking at the impact of structural policies with respect to smoking and smoking cessation and the, the issues um, with respect to, you know, challenges for lung cancer screenings that they've just uh, reduced the pack load demand so that it's more appropriate for African American adults who smoke. And I'm just curious when you're when you're thinking about all of these, how how uh, environmental factors such as smoking uh, interacts with the environment as you're thinking about it with asthma and lung health. I don't know what happened to me. No. Okay, am I on? You're on. Um, great question. I think that if you look at, there's, there's a lot of data, for example, going back to redlining and it, it's a higher uh, passive uh, smoke exposure in kids that leads to disease, uh, burn of disease in kids with asthma, for example. There's higher rates of uh, smoking. Uh, in Colorado, for example, one of the highest rates uh, of vaping is in Latino youth. Um, so all these things, I think they all, come, they all come together. And very good data from Colorado shows that um, practitioners are much less likely to offer smoking cessation to black patients, for example, and Latino patients. Um, so there is both the burden of exposure, but also there's a structural differences in the way we approach prevention. Uh, many, and I think a lot, of, a lot of providers instinctively or in conscious biases like why worry this patient is already too sick or they're not gonna stop. And so those kinds of things tend to be a lot more active when somebody is from a different racial group than you are. I'm trying to read, you can hear it, very good. I just have to second what Lynn you know, said, thank you very much. This was a wonderful and very important talk. The question I have is if we're going to be dealing with this, Fernando, you had on one of your earlier slides that it begins in utero. Is this where we really need to begin? Because I think there are data quite clearly that if you know the mother has you know, respiratory disease, the child is at high risk, and yes. how these factors go trans 
placentally, we don't really know, but is this where we really should be putting our effort to try to prevent the transmission of these risk factors? Be interested in your comments. Yeah, I don't know, if, did, did, did people here in the back? Yeah. So I think that's a very good question. I, the way I, this is such a complex problem, Bill, that I think we need to have a multi-pronged approach, but certainly in utero exposures is one of the major ones. I mean, there's, there's very good data, for example, that VOC exposure or pollutants cause epigenetic changes uh, in, in, in the baby. And these things get, you know, you may actually lead to somebody down the road, you know, developing um, ineffective lung growth, for example, which will impact them for the rest of their lives. So I think we have to really take into account the exposures at that level, but also those that occur later in life. I mean, it's not gonna be, you know, important uh, interventions are gonna have to be multifaceted and multi-pronged. Um, and so, but, but you're right, we have to start somewhere. And I think in utero exposure in pregnancy, it's a, it's a very vulnerable population. Yes, sir. Fernando, thank you very much for outstanding talk and for visiting. My question is, when, when you look at the United States, how do we compare to other countries that have people from different backgrounds? So we, I don't think we are unique in having people from different backgrounds in this country. So how do we compare to other countries with regard to equity in healthcare? Yeah, that's a very good question. I would say, depends on the country you compare yourself to. Um, you know, there's, there's tremendous, I, I, I grew up in Mexico, I went to school there. Mexico, for example, has a tremendous amount of um, healthcare disparities. Uh, that, are, that are different in, in some levels that relate to different types of funding of uh, institutions and access to healthcare. Uh, but then if you, look for, if you look at any other indices of uh, preventable diseases or, and chronic manifestations of disease, when you look at some European countries, for example, where they have a more socially um, structured system of care, you'll see that they, have, they, they outpace us almost in every metric possible. So, you know. So it depends, I think, on broad scalability of solutions that are available to the general population. Hi, Fernando. Uh, terrific talk. Thank you so much. <clears throat> um, you know, as physicians, we usually think about asthma and other diseases at the individual level. You know, how can we help the patient that's in the room with us now? And um, redlining and many of the uh, things that you presented today really work at the neighborhood level. I mean, redlining showed us how destructive, you know, policy can be at the neighborhood level. Have there been interventions at the neighborhood level that have really shown good effects? I, I can't think of one, Jim, that's a great question. And the reason why I, I venture to say that there's not many of them is because it requires a lot of money and a lot of different levels of interventions, you know, policy, local policy makers, federal government, communities. And we, these are normally parts of society, um, policy that don't talk to each other. So this is why we don't have, it requires a huge amount of investment uh, and we just don't see it uh, as much. I think the, the issue what's changing, and I think one of, somebody in my group is tracking this, is that one of the things I didn't talk about is that the, these maps have changed a little bit. There's been gentrification, and now we're looking, but gentrification means that more affluent people move into neighborhoods that, was once, that were once considered less desirable, and those people actually don't live there anymore, they got displaced. So we're now we're tracking what happens to people that are displaced in terms of some of the health effects and respiratory health effects. But you're right, there's not a lot of neighborhood interventions. Well, I'm, I'm gonna say that, sorry, their, their government, once this became widely known, the government created called um, Fair Housing Act, later instituted in the 60s, citing that the policy of redlining was uh, unlawful. So it's not lawful anymore, but the consequences of them are still pretty much alive. Hi, thank you for your talk. Um, my name is Christine Sharkey in rheumatology. Um, my question is a little bit about what happened during COVID. I think a lot of the press or lay press talked about asthma doing better. Um, um, there were less um, patients coming to the hospital with, with flare ups. And I was curious about your comments on um, how that you actually saw that through different um, groups and did that really pan out? And what do you see now post our uh, yeah, no, time. great question. I, I, I wanted to include it, but then my, my, my I mean, two minutes <laughs> two minutes late. You know, what happened in COVID was a very, was a perfect example of health disparities. As you remember in the first wave, the majority of people and those that died uh, in New York and other cities were mostly Hispanic and black. Uh, 
My ICU, for example, in Denver, where I used to work in the COVID unit, at one point, every single patient in our unit was non-white. So people that were actually dying on the ventilator um, were of minority groups. And I think this happened for a variety of reasons, existing comorbidities. Um, these are people that had to go to work, right? Groceries. There's people in the School of Public Health were tracking mobility during the pandemic. And they saw that the mobility rate on minority groups was much greater than, so white people, so staying at home is a privilege, right? But people cannot stay at home and they had to go out, they got, they got exposed and they also had higher rates of diabetes and obesity and other things. And that ended up led into a, a huge disparity on, on COVID mortality and morbidity. Thank you again for uh, just a wonderful overview of so much work that we need to do. Um, one question I have too, in the state of Wisconsin here being a uh, rural state with some urban clustering, um, you know, undoubtedly these types of factors you're describing kind of at a urban level uh, are substantial at a rural level too. And um, so I'm just wondering to what extent, you know, you uh, incorporate that rural rurality into some of your analyses. No, that's, that's great. I did not incorporate, I think, Less is not about, obviously, there was no redlining was a, a urban phenomenon, not a, not a rural phenomenon. But one of the things that is really impacting rural health tremendously is the closure of primary care sites and less access to healthcare and people having to travel much longer to, to, get, to, to get care. So there's, there's actually good data that there's a, a tremendous amount of disparities just by rural and urban settings. And asthma is definitely one, one of them, for sure. <laughs> I'm going to pause and take an online question first from Mihaila Tedrescu. Thank you for this great, awesome talk and new perspective. Um, how and when do you think this will impact the requirements for research inclusiveness? Mm. Yeah. That was a really, really good question. Um, if you do NIH research, we all have to do these population tables that I'm very critical about because what you have to do is you have to recruit populations that mirror our distribution of population based on federal standards. But what it does not do is allows you to do meaningful analysis with those numbers, right? Like if you have a small study, like I have a study of 60 patients, right? If I recruit six blacks and five Hispanics, I'm not gonna be able to say anything in such a small numbers that is meaningful to research and science. So I think there has to be a lot more focus effort on doing specific studies, focusing on problems for minority populations that are relevant and have the right numbers to make um, inferences about. Shobi Cheda, I'm practicing general internist. Thank you for an amazing talk. One of the things that struck me is how much you've demonstrated that disparities are getting worse. And then you also showed new guidelines and made a comment that you think these are going to make disparities worse. <laughs> My question is, what do we do to stop making things worse. Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> it's a very easy question, thank you. <laughs> no, uh, great question. I think this, these, many of these decisions are taken out of context as the uh, sort of uh, overall population effect. We're just focusing on what makes people better. But then there's a lot of, I think there's a loss of intervention at the implementation level, right? Like if you're rolling something like this, somebody should be asking on the background, hey, how are people gonna afford this therapy? How will you distribute this therapy, right? And so for us that see patients on, on Medicaid or uninsured patients, you know, you, you, want, you want them on these drugs and they cannot afford it. So you end up doing a substandard treatment that you know is harmful at some level. So, I mean, I, I wish I had an answer for you, but um, I think the way that we can, there's actually, it's, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna say something different. Yes, something positive. Um, you know, I, I think that there's, there, are, there are broader changes in society and systems that need to happen, and I think we need to advocate for. But there are also things that we personally do, the way we care for patients, the way we treat them. And these are, these are things that we can make differences in our own practice that are, can be very meaningful uh, to patients and helping them get the best treatment, advocating for them, uh, and acknowledging that what people bring to the to the table, bring to the office, uh, when they're part of a minority group, it's a very complicated um, phenomenon where people are dealing with a tremendous amount of uh, stress from being exposed to things that we, we as not in minority groups uh, don't understand. I mean, I'm not Hispanic. One of my friends used to tell me, Fernando, you're white until you talk. 
So, so you know, I don't experience the same level of discrimination because I look white, but but uh, but people that look different are always hyper aware of how they're being perceived and talked to and attended to, and so these are things that we can try to change in our own environment. So I have I have a question. Um, so. Um... As part of medical history taking, we have not routinely captured social determinants of health. Yes. Um, can you talk about how you capture some of that information and what we can be doing from a you know data gathering and influencing our care of patients by yeah. incorporating that? No, thanks, Lynn. That's a great question. I think we need to do that very systematically. Uh, there's a lot of practice variation. For example, one, one of the things I do with my patients is I always start uh, regardless of who the patient is, I always start my visits um, when somebody sits for the first time. I said, "Tell me about yourself," and they start to like talk about their symptoms. I'm like, "No, tell me about like what kind of work do you do? Where do you live? Where do you play? Uh, what are your important relationships?" And, and and I and I put that in my notes. So I'll never say this is a 50 year old uh, patient. I'll say this is a 50 year old mother, an accountant, and whatever, whatever. So that that gives me a frame. Um, of references as to uh, as to who I'm dealing with, and I think that we we as physicians and providers need to personalize our patients, not just as some as people with disease, but as as individuals experiencing disease, which is a very different paradigm. So there's another online question. Um, can you address the potential for leveraging the public education system to address health disparities? Yeah, and that's a great question. I think that I would love. Um, to see a lot like more of these uh, being in parent schools. And unfortunately, we're in a very, very complicated political climate um, where many of the things that can be, that, you know, our ability to look at race more critically is challenged. But I think that we need to be imparting this at a very young age because I was, as I was reading for this talk, uh, I read an article that started saying, you know, people are not born with biases or with racism. These are things we learn from our inter uh, interactions in society. So I think the earlier we intervene in kids uh, and teach them how to appraise each other in a much more human, compassionate way, will go a long way down the road. It's a, it's a long-term intervention though. And then um, another question from me, um, you talked about race adjustment for lung function. Um, I know it's, it's an area of a lot of discussion in the pulmonary community, how yeah. to best move forward. What are your thoughts on um, how we should be presenting lung function yeah. in our patients and some of the recent recommendations and right. the global health initiatives? We've developed more universal uh, standards to capture some of the determinants of lung function. And so these are, we have a thing called the Global Lung Initiative that was started by Professor Quanger and others. And, um, so I think we have better, better estimates that are not necessarily so racially biased. Um, so I think, you know, I talk to my patients now, you know, lung function tests come with a, with a standardized score. So, uh, and I actually use that to my patients. I'm like, you know, if this score is zero, you're like the average. You know, if you're minus one, you're moving away from the, from the average and you start sort of starting to falling down into a lesser group that has more impacts on lung function. So I think standardizing things into Z scores and global lung initiative assessment, it's a better tool. Yeah, well, it's interesting because the global, the GLI, is, has um, not great representation of Asian population. So correct. not perfect. Not perfect, yeah. But perhaps better. And a good start. It's a start. It's a start, yes. yes. X, X. And, the, and the pulmonary community has embraced it really well, I think. Yeah. Okay, well, thank you again. Let's give Dr. Olquin a big hand.